Madam President, I have come this afternoon to speak about the uh, regulation that was proposed by the administration on Monday um, relating to the Environmental Protection Agency. This time, the agency's target is a 30 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from existing power, gener uh, power plants by the year 2030. Now, the regulation that has been announced, which has been the subject of a great deal of conversation this week, should not be confused with EPA rules for cooling water intake or for proposed power plants or for cross-state air pollution or for boilers or for ozone or for incinerators or for regional haze or for fuel economy or for the waters of the United States or for renewable fuels or for cement kilns or for coal ash or for or for effluent limitations or for any other number of regulatory actions that the agency has either taken or is expected to take. This rule, and, and it just seems that there have been so many of them, you almost feel like this should be uh, EPA's rule of the week or rule of the month. This is a unilateral effort to bypass Congress and to force into place policies that we in Congress have not approved. The goal is to push our electric supply away from coal and I think ultimately um, away from natural gas as soon as possible. Now, as the ranking member on the Energy Committee, I can attest that energy is always the flip side of the environmental debate. It just, you've got the discussion about the energy and you've always got discussion about the environment. I believe that we should advance policies that make our energy abundant, affordable, clean, diverse, and secure. And to that end, our environmental goals must be balanced with our energy needs. And because of this, I have for years expressed concern that EPA's relentless onslaught will harm the affordability and the reliability the affordability and the reliability of our electric supply. In fact, I even released a white paper on this matter uh, earlier this year. We still do not have an accurate accounting of the cumulative costs associated with all of these EPA rules that I just kind of did the laundry list to, but we do know not to trust their math because EPA has dramatically underestimated power plant retirements in the very recent past. Give you some examples here. For the mercury and air toxics rules, EPA estimated only 4.7 gigawatts of coal-fired coal -fired capacity retirements by the year 2015. But then we see the contrast. Labor unions forecast that MATS alone would result in 55 gigawatts of coal plant retirements and the loss of some 250,000 jobs. Our government experts have determined that approximately 10 to 20 percent of existing coal capacity could be retired by the middle of the next decade. This is a calculation that really dwarfs EPA's number and one that doesn't, doesn't include the potential impacts of the latest proposal. Now, Madam President, I know that the EPA has an important job to do. And I appreciate that. But I also recognize that it does not and cannot regulate in a vacuum. Baseload coal and the ancillary services that it provides account for almost 40 percent of our power. In many instances, EPA's regulations will render generating units uneconomic with compliance requiring retrofitting, the use of best available technology, and downtime for installation. So I'm concerned, I'm greatly concerned that EPA's rules, particularly when you combine them with one another, will result in a grid that is less stable, less reliable. The cumulative effect of federal regulations on baseload capacity, resources, whether they're coal or nuclear, which produce electricity on demand, we, we have to look at this cumulative effect. We have to examine and appreciate it, not discount or ignore it. Now, I know that uh, uh, many this past winter got a taste of what uh, life in Alaska is like in the wintertime when, when we experience the polar vortex here in the lower 48. 
The polar vortex caused 50,000 megawatts of power plant outages. For one key system, 89% of the coal capacity that is scheduled for retirement next year because of an EPA rule was called upon to meet the rising demand. So again, just think about that. We've got, we had a tough winter. We had, we had coal uh, producing facilities that were able to step up and, and provide for that, that increased demand. 89% of that coal capacity was, was utilized during uh, this polar vortex. So that's fine. But what happens when those facilities are now offline? When they are in retirement, when, they're, when you do not have that backup? The question that we really need to be asking is what happens when that capacity is gone? Because hoping for a mild winter isn't a viable strategy. You can't have kind of a hope and a prayer energy policy, hoping that the weather's not going to be so bad. Our nation relies on installed dispatchable power generation during extreme weather, which is why we need to ensure grid reliability through a, diversify, a diversity of baseload capacity. Today it's unclear how many plants will retrofit to comply with various EPA regulations, including this most recent one, as opposed to just making the decision to just shut it down. It's uncertain if there will be enough time to say nothing of, of sufficient capital available for investment to build these new facilities or other forms of generation needed to ensure the continued reliability of the grid. Madam President, I have been talking about grid reliability for a long while now. And, and I think it, it, it speaks to our system that, well, we may have been pushed to, to the edge of getting nervous, we have been able to meet that, uh, that reliability requirement that, that Americans have just come to expect. They want to know that when, uh, when they want to have the lights on or keep cool or keep warm, that there is that availability. Reliability is key here. I'm even more troubled that EPA, which has conceded that a single rule may have what they're calling localized effects that they have not sought for, from our grid regulators. FERC and NERC, an analysis of the cumulative impact its rules may have. Understanding, again, the impacts by checking in with our grid regulators, checking in with FERC and NERC. Um, this, is, this is an important part of what needs to go on, and yet we're not seeing that, that follow through. Instead, EPA appears to be morphing into this industrial planning agency for the energy sector. That's not what they're designed to do. This latest rulemaking makes it even more important for FERC and the Department of Energy to step up, to really go toe-to-toe -to -toe here with EPA to protect the reliability and the affordability of our power supply. The current chairwoman of FERC, well, while she has not called for a formal official role for the commission, as many of us would like, is certainly up to the task, in my view. Um, but we've got a situation at play right now uh, within the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. It appears that the White House doesn't want to keep the acting chair in charge. Its nominee to serve as chairman, in my view, is both short on, on energy experience and largely unaware of the electric reliability implications of EPA's rules. In response to a hearing question about grid reliability from Senator Manchin, the nominee conceded that he, quote, has not been following the decisional process at EPA closely enough to know. Well, I find that that response is not only disturbing, I think it raises the question of whether or not anyone within the administration is actually following the EPA process closely enough to know what will happen to our electric grid. I can tell you that I don't think that EPA knows the impacts for my state of Alaska. The agency readily admits that its proposal fails to account for the expected costs and benefits for areas outside of the contiguous United States. Well, Madam President, 
We're one-fifth the size of the country. We are part of the country, but the EPA, in, in advancing these proposed regs, admits that we don't know. We don't know the cost-benefit for Alaska. We don't know the cost-benefit for Hawaii here. But that does not mean, that does not mean that my state is exempt from this rule as some reports have led Alaskans to believe. Instead, without the benefit of any analysis, EPA has directed Alaska to reduce our emissions by 26 percent. And this, while well, EPA ignores, totally ignores, the likely inflationary costs um, and the increases inherent in requiring the revamping of so much power production, likely within a single decade here. Now, the EPA has recommended that states work together, work together to figure this out, how we're going to make these cuts. But again, when you're not part of the contiguous United States, it's a little more difficult for us in Alaska and, and uh, our neighbors to the south in Hawaii. If you're not part of an interstate electric grid, Alaska is, is really in many, many ways on its own. Because of our constant need for federal approvals, or at best, federal cooperation, that is too often slow to come, we're not even able to develop our clean hydropower. And some may ask, well, I understand that you've got about 25 percent of your, of your power in the state of Alaska that comes from hydro. That is correct. But because of other federal policies, whether it's the roadless rule or, or other policies, we are, we're, we're truly hamstrung in our ability to build out more hydro. Based on more than 50 years of delayed or broken federal promises, there is no guarantee that we'll be able to develop fully our abundant natural gas or even our vast renewable resource potential. We've just got, we've got challenges. And we acknowledge them. We're working on those challenges. We're working diligently because there's nobody that wants to get reliable, affordable, clean, diverse energy supplies to our state more honestly and earnestly than myself. But it is challenging. And so as we, as we work towards that transition, we need that flexibility. We need that time. Now, EPA has suggested a series of strategies for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But of the five power plants in Alaska that are directly impacted by this proposed rule, four are natural gas fire plants, and they're located near each other and an anchorage. So in the whole state of Alaska, there are only five plants, Madam President, that are impacted by this regulation. Everything else is small enough or, or doesn't sell their power. Um, so of the four, uh, excuse me, of the five, four of them are already natural gas. Um, the fifth already has the clean coal technology. The proposed strategies of switching to natural gas, dispatch changes, or retiring plants are, are really just unworkable given the configuration that we have in my state. And given that we live in this polar vortex every winter, every winter is polar vortex in Alaska, many of our houses are already well insulated to protect from the cold, so efficiency programs um, will provide comparatively small gains. Now, having said that, I know that we can and must do more when it comes to efficiencies, and I will continue to push on that because that's one area that I think that we can make a difference. But trying to get to this 26 percent reduction is a challenge. And I'm still canvassing my state, but it will be difficult for Alaska to reach our 26 percent emissions reduction without serious economic impacts. Electricity is already more expensive in Alaska than in most of the rest of the nation. We have to reduce these prices, not engage in policies that will raise those prices even higher. Madam President, here in, in the lower 48, on average, um, an American family spends about four a little over 4 percent of their, of their household budget goes towards um, their, their energy, keeping the lights on and keeping the house warm or cool, depending on your season. In, in Alaska, in many parts of my state, I, we have households that pay between 40 and 50 percent of their household budget to stay warm 
to keep the lights on. So I'm looking at this very, very critically. Well, I want to ensure that our air is, is clean, that we are working to reduce health risks. We don't have any room in Alaska to increase our energy costs. We've got to be working aggressively with one another to reduce those costs. So I, I, I look at the proposal that has come out from EPA this week, and, and I am, I'm very concerned about how a state like mine will achieve the level that the EPA has imposed on it without extraordinary increases to costs. Now, some have labeled this, this recent EPA proposed regulation, they've labeled it Obamacare 2.0, and in many ways it is. The administration insists that there will be no cost increases associated with this rule, that all, you know, all we're missing here is an awful website and a pledge that, well, if you like your current electricity bill, you can keep it. The president promises that electricity bills will shrink. But, Madam President, I'm not buying that. The Wall Street Journal has rightly labeled this a huge tax on the poor and the middle class, and no one understands what will happen if states perhaps refuse to move forward with their own plans. And again, you have to ask the question, does anybody really think that the EPA has the ability to impose its federal will while simultaneously keeping the lights on and keeping power affordable to, to all 50 states. Madam President, despite negative economic growth last quarter and despite far better approaches pending in Congress to promote energy efficiency and energy innovation, and I note that my colleague from Ohio who has been working doggedly to try to advance an energy efficiency bill, um, a measure that I think is smart and sound and, and built on good policy, working to, to not only help states like mine, but all across the country. We, we do have some good proposals out there. We have initiatives that we can move forward. But instead, the President has decided to push ahead and to propose a sweeping new regulation on our still weak economy. We must keep cost and reliability in mind as, as regulatory mandates push more and more baseload coal plants offline. FERC must be the unambiguous champion of reliability with a formal and a documented role in EPA's rulemaking process. Powerful regulatory laws must be judiciously administered, and only Congress, only Congress and not the EPA should decide such consequential changes for our energy supply, our economy, and our people. Anything less, I think, is unacceptable and could very well yield significant negative consequences for a wide variety of American families and our businesses. With that, Madam President, uh, I thank you for your attention and the opportunity to discuss a very important issue uh, around the country.